And the role of lighting is to enhance these grand passions and these dramatic moments so that the audience not only sees them, but feels them. And again, as Robert Edmund Jones said, when the beam of light strikes with the precision of a mot juste, then we realize the livingness of light. And so this afternoon on our panel, we have an important part of that living history of Broadway. And they will be discussing the evolution of lighting, the present state of the art, and suggestions for the future. Our moderator is Ken Billington. That's me. <laughs> Ken has designed over 50 Broadway shows, including Sweeney Todd, On the 20th Century, Side by Side by Sondheim, Working, End of the World, Foxfire, and Meet Me in St. Louis. Off-Broadway productions include The Lisbon Traviata, What the Butler Saw, and Fortune in Men's Eyes. He recently created the television lighting for Showboat and Our Town on PBS. Other projects range from lighting for cabaret superstars Anne Margaret and Shirley MacLaine to designing some of the world's most exciting nightclubs in New York and Tokyo. Mr. Billington has been nominated for five Tonys and three Drama Desk Awards and has received <coughs> two Los Angeles Drama Critics Awards, the Ace Award for Television Lighting, and two Lumen Awards for his architectural design. Ted Billington. Thank you. I have, we have to move your microphone first. Thing. Mike, thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, I will do a brief introduction of my colleagues here at the table. Then we will go into um, really what a lighting designer is, what we do, where we come from, which might actually help all of you learn uh, a little bit more about the collaborative effort of uh, lighting in the theater. Uh, so first of all, I will introduce uh, Jeff Davis, who is on my right. Uh, Jeff is a lighting designer living here in New York. His first Broadway show was a show called Ride the Wind in 1974. I think it was a short-lived Broadway show. Uh, he's designed various Broadway productions, including Born Yesterday, Death of a Salesman, The Man Who Came to Dimmer, those revivals, as well as the musical comedy Murders of 1940, Edward Dalby's Man Who Had Three Arms, Romance Language, uh, of Portrait of Jenny Off-Broadway. For television, Jeff's designed uh, many specials uh, called Canvas on Ice with Olympic figure skating Brian Botano, ice sculptures for ABC, and the ice sequence of Happy New Year USA. So we're glad to have Jeff with us. Uh, to my left is Theron Musser, who uh, is um, a lady I assisted way back when I was like 19. You're not dead long. Yeah, when, <laughs> when I was 19 and she, uh, this was very nice to take this kid in. Um, Theron's first Broadway show was Long Day's Journey Into Night in 1956, the original production. For many seasons, she was the resident designer of the American Shakespeare Festival Theater in Stratford, Connecticut, with the National Repertory Theater, the Jose Limon Dance Company, and for many seasons, has been working at the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles. Broadway productions have included Mame, Applause, A Little Night Music, the Neil Simon plays The Good Doctor, California Suite, Prisoner of Second Avenue, Sunshine Boys, Brighton Beach Memoirs, Biloxi Blues, Broadway Brown, and The Current Rumors, as well as Ballroom, The Act, 42nd Street, and she won the Tony for her lighting for Follies, Dream Girls, and of course, a chorus line, Theron Musser. To my far right, uh, Peggy Clark. Uh, it's great to have Peggy come in uh, to, from Brooklyn to be with us today. Um, her first Broadway show was Beggar's Holiday in 1946, followed two months later by Brigadoon in uh, 1947. She's also the first lighting designer ever that was listed on a poster, and, uh, and that was for Medea in 1947. So um, we are a very young profession, and uh, we, uh, you know, sound designer is probably a little newer than we are, but we're actually, for years, we're the babies. Uh, as well as her many Broadway shows, Peggy did the lighting for 28 city center revivals, 26 productions for the LA Civic Light Opera, the Jones Beach Marine Theater, and American Ballet Theater. Some of her Broadway credits are On the Town, High Button Shoes, Bells Are Ringing, Miss Liberty, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, Paint Your Wagon, Song in Norway, Kismet, Peter Pan, Plain and Fancy, the plays Auntie Mame and No Time for Sergeants, as well as Bye Bye Birdie and the unsinkable Molly Brown, Peggy Clark. Okay. 
I, I get exhausted thinking about that many musicals. <laughs> Uh, my extreme last is Abe Fader, uh, known in the industry as Lighting by Fader. Um, when I looked at his uh, resume when I was making up uh, this little introduction here, I saw that his first Broadway show that he designed the lighting for was a play called Trick for Trick, which I do not know, at the Sam H. Harris Theater in February of 1932. From 1935... <laughs> <laughs> But do you remember it, Abe? I don't know. <laughs> From 1935 to 1939, he was the lighting designer and technical director for all the federal theater projects, the WPA, supervising the lighting for over 200 productions, including The Living Newspapers, One Third a Nation, and The Cradle Will Rock. In 1941, he became the lighting designer and production coordinator for the first season of the American Ballet Theater and designed 21 productions for them, including Peter and the Wolf and Giselle, while continuing to design on Broadway, including Angel Street and The Skin of Our Teeth. While serving in the Air Force during the Second World War, he designed the lighting for the Air Force production of Winged Victory at the 44th Street Theater. Since then, he has designed numerous shows, including Out of This World, Inherit the Wind, My Fair Lady, Visit to a Small Planet, Orpheus Descending, and At the Grand, both of which are on Broadway right now in very different productions, Camelot, and On a Clear Day You Can See Forever. Highlights of his architectural in career include the Kaufman Auditorium, the YMHA in New York, the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the Minskoff Theater, as well as lighting Kennedy Airport and the RCA Building in New York City. <laughs> Fader. As you can see, we have the history of lighting sitting up here in front of you, and I think that is one of the most exciting things. I'm really excited to be up here. Uh, I've never had all these people together, and it makes it very interesting. You know, the idea of this whole thing is to preserve the history of theater in a historical perspective. And I think we can do a lot of that today. And um, what we're going to do is ask some questions. We'll have uh, some answers from everybody. Uh, you may like them, you may not. Uh, and we hope you will ask us some questions later on. So um, first thing I want to ask is, what is a lighting designer? Now, I know everyone knows that you can turn on the lights in your living room with a wall dimmer, so you are now a lighting designer. But uh, what is a lighting designer and what do we do? Uh, maybe Theron should start that one. I knew you'd like that. <laughs> <laughs> she told me, you see, so I think she can tell you. Well, then you should have remembered it. <laughs> <laughs> well, lighting design has, uh, as Ken has indicated, come a long way when, uh, thanks to the development of technology, thanks to people somehow uh, becoming more selective in terms of their visibility. Um, what we do with a show, or what we like to hope, think that we do, is create the atmosphere for that uh, play, that scene, that dance, uh, whatever the presentation, to happen in. And even though it's, most of the time, uh, not anything that you're visibly aware of, I keep insisting that if the atmosphere is right, if the aura is right for a piece, that uh, it does affect people subconsciously. I don't believe in rules and all of that, that tragedies are dark and comedies are bright, even though it tends to be that way. I don't think you can live by rules. Uh, I've had a lot of directors uh, come to me, particularly since we're a new profession, as it were, and say, I don't know how to talk to you people, because they tend to think we're electricians and that we talk in watts and kilowatts and ohms and whatever all that is. Uh, <laughs> and say, well, talk to me like you talk to your actors. Talk about the atmosphere that you see the scene happening in and the texture of it. Um, I'll pull down an art book and look at pictures just in terms of a palette uh, that helps the emotional feeling, or at least uh, helps that director present the emotional feeling he wants to. We say our basic responsibility is visibility, and that's true, but it's the kind of visibility that is provided that we pride ourselves on uh, knowing how to do, and helping that scene rather than killing that scene, which we can do. Um, we can make an applause bigger or happen in a musical number uh, just by the way we manipulate the lights, or we can kill it by the way we manipulate the lights. 
Um, it's all affecting, I think, the subconscious. But it's our responsibility to design the kind of visibility that this production, whatever it may be, should be seen in. That's rather oversimplified, but uh, that's the basic. Uh, many times that, of course, can get uh, distorted to uh, everyone forgetting why you came to the theater that day. Um, you know, the jokes to many directors and many producers and many playwrights are not funny unless they're very bright. I always tell them maybe the uh, jokes aren't funny. Uh, but I remember once driving down the Hollywood freeway passing the playwright of the play I was doing who rolled down his window and yelled, brighter, brighter, brighter. I rolled down my window and yelled, funnier, funnier, funnier. <laughs> so that happens. Um, the uh, concept, Peggy, when, years, when lighting was so new, how did you deal with directors and uh, to get and producers so you could uh, do the art form that is lighting design. Did you have a hard time uh, uh, convincing them that A, they needed to hire you, um, or uh, that it was, uh, that lighting was even necessary? I mean, I'm sure they all knew that uh, we needed to turn the lights on, but was there anything more difficult than uh, getting them to understand the, the art form? <clears throat> yes, they, they uh they wanted a quality, a, a, the, the sense of color, the sense of atmosphere. And they particularly wanted light where they wanted it and not where they didn't. That has always been a lighting designer's problems. <laughs> <laughs> and a good deal of lighting is, is not lighting what you don't want lighted at that time. Uh, Well, uh, I remember when I did a Plain and Fancy for uh, Dick Colmar, and he said he wanted, wanted to know what the lighting was all about. So I started to explain my light plot to him, and that, that was a mistake. I lost him after we got <laughs> down off the balcony rail. <laughs> Well, they never really want to know about they all didn't those. Really want to know. Yeah, Watts and all that, which I don't. It wasn't understand. Watts I was looking for either. I was right. just trying to let them know what they needed <laughs> to see what they needed, and he really got very bored after the balcony rail. We were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Abe, you um, go back a little bit further and. and inventing this uh, business that we're all in. How did you get them all convinced up front that uh, they needed to have us around? You know, <clears throat> when I got called to do this, and I said, what the devil am I gonna talk about? The history of a past, since I'm the oldest living inhabitant here, still alive. Some of you weren't alive. And I said, Ken, I wanna be last. Did you talk to Jeff yet? No. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. Talk to Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> what can you elaborate on this? <laughs> no, Jeff and I uh, both, I believe, assisted Theron. Jeff uh, had the great privilege of being Joe Melziner's assistant for many years, uh, who was also a great lighting designer. Did uh, was there anything that? Joe taught you about going into all of this that made it interesting and uh, where, how to deal with all these people in the theater. Well, there's so much of it, but I think that one of the major things he did, and if you look at any of his sketches, it's very evident that he was very aware that the first thing you had to watch on the stage was an actor. And if you look at any of his sketches, the first thing you see is an actor in arrested motion in a period costume. And not only in the way he painted his sketches, but in the way the set was also designed and the painter's elevations were done, most often there was a lot of detail around the actors, and then it suddenly vanished or went into black <coughs> or went into nothing. Uh, so his constant focus all the time was on the actor at any given moment in the play or the musical. And I think somehow keeping that's a part of theater that we've lost that now you go and watch an amusement park on stage as opposed to the people that are performing the show. And um, that was always the thing that he kept going back to as the actor. And the you know, directors would say, well, 
I don't like the door here. We take his pencil out and write, okay, where do you want it? It doesn't, that doesn't really matter. The total elevation of what it was was what mattered and the environment that surrounded the actor. Uh, although he'd be the first to tell you that the set designer basically directs the play uh, <laughs> because of the way this, the ground plan is done. But there was also, he always had this belief that the less people you had doing the jobs, the better, which is why he liked doing scenery and lighting. Uh, because you didn't have to sit there and argue with a set designer about can you get the border out of the way so you can hang the electric pipe here to light the actors properly. Um, but it was always, I think, one was not designed without the thought of the other. And I think that's also another, from my point of view, one of the things that's missing now is that collaborative effort with a set designer and a costume designer. So often uh, we're all hired now to do things at the last minute. and. Uh, Anyway, it's an era, I think, that is somewhat gone. That's true. Well, I, I know many times that I've, uh, I, I, I enjoy very much working with Oliver Smith, because Oliver Smith is a designer who still paints a picture. And I always find that interesting. When he goes to a director, many directors do not have a great sense of what a lighting designer does. A lot do, by the way. Uh, and he shows the picture of what <clears throat> scene one looks like. You know what scene one looks like. Uh, many times we'll get on a show now and the designer presents a white model uh, of the scene, but no sketches, no elevations, uh, un and uncolored. So everyone looks at it and sees this lovely white model. I remember once doing a very successful Broadway show where the white model had been shown to everybody. We got to Boston and the director started screaming, where's the magenta light? I had never heard the word magenta ever in my life on the production. It was all about all the soft pastels to make everyone beautiful. Uh, and I laid that a little bit at the feet of the uh, set designer because he didn't uh, help, help us at all in focusing. He should have, uh, did a beautiful, lovely white model. So it's, uh, it, pictures help, and it helps everyone understand what's going on. Um, can I talk to you now, Abe, or should I yeah. keep going? Oh, okay. <laughs> I felt a kind of a load as the horse that wins the derby, when it goes on to the next race, they put more weight on him. And since I'm, I guess, the survivor of where it started, and the people there, I thought it was proper to do a few notes and sequence to sum up where I've been. So let's start with, I'm very grateful to have been invited here. And with those to my, my right, two of which have been close to me for many years, to be standing and sitting here doing this, I'm delighted to be here. And to Ken, thank you. Thank you. And Jeff. The year is 1942. The play is The Skin of Our Teeth by Thornton Wilder. The curtain goes up in the third act. Tallulah Bankhead playing Sabina, the irreverent, irresponsible character who breaks all the rules, rushes across the smoke-filled stage in a blue mist light, shouting, Mrs. Antropus, where are you? From below we hear, down here, Sabina, in the basement. She rushes to center stage and opens the trap door, revealing a bright yellow gray light. From below, Mrs. Antropus asks Sabina, what was it like during the war? Sabina replies, it was wonderful. Everybody loved each other. She then steps back, and the light on her face has turned to muddy gray yellow. She's lost her prettiness. She's lost her youth. She's begun to look old and ravaged. It took one week to find just that right effect of lighting magic, to capture that look of hopelessness, the look of one who has known freedom and then lost it again. How can you do any play in the world without sets? You can do any play in the world without costumes. I'm sorry, I should say without sets. Do without them. 
But can you do any play anywhere in the world without light, controlled, then in an environment where the answer when you turn the switch off is black? So light's a very important ingredient. And the kind of light you use, controlling the mood of the play, you're in. But it was not always accepted, because lighting design was not always accepted as a separate art. When I began my professional career in 1932 with a show called Trick for Trick, a lighting designer was not even acknowledged in those years. The director of the show was a very talented director, Harry Wagstaff Gribble, also a playwright, envisioned the, the production and passed on his requirement to the local electrician. The theater is made up of strangers who become collaborators, costume designers, directors, actors, technicians, stage managers, lighting designers, and the producer who puts it together. They all have one ingredient. They share that's been trained with a built-in passion for what encompasses the whole of a theater production. And for that rare moment when they're all assembled to listen to the words of the writer, and the idea of the play, each one has to probe within themselves that which will make the play soar and become alive. Why? Because the most important ingredient is you, the audience. You haven't been there through the creative process, through the anguish, the time limits of professional theater, and the economics. Yes, always the economics of money. To that moment, when you come into the theater completely unaware of all of us and our interests. Will we bestir you? That's the goal we collectively seek. That's the heroic magic that we remember beyond paintings and canvases, beyond music, almost with the emotional value of a religious fervor. Yet, there are hardcore mechanics behind that curtain line which to me is theater lighting design. It's not as simple as a paintbrush and a canvas. It's not as simple as playing an instrument. Its elements are structure. It's pipes hung on cable in the air, up and down. It's bulky physical equipment that's being hung sometimes 30, 40 feet in the air. And how do you get there? By ladders and lifts, like you're building a building. And worst of all, the irony of the Broadway theater is from the curtain line to the back wall, mostly 30 feet. This house is deeper than that. And what you've seen on it has been magical. And what's in the lighting designer's bag? In various shapes and bottles. It's this. I thought this was wonderful back in 1937. <laughs> because they put a little coil coil filament, I'd get a spot right out of it. Now it's this. Now it's this. Now it's this. Wonderful? We're the stepchildren of the lighting industry. <laughs> <laughs> a four billion dollar industry. And most of us have to piggyback on the breakthroughs of the commercial world. That's the reality that we who work as lighting designers must live through. It's not the other way around. Why in the hell do you want to do it? I don't know. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> Last, this little book called Gels. Color. And what does that mean? The light comes through the bulbs, never a proper tint for the visual needs and the effect, and therefore the gels and the probing over it when the lights dim down and the different character, what happens in the lower brilliance of the filament would become orange and compensate that in the filter. Now, isn't that a pretty good introduction about lighting? <laughs> <laughs> Oddly enough, all of these people, 
and those who came out, come out of the schools and all, all had roots somewhere. When I came to New York, there was a place called the Yiddish Theater. Took a theater. They went into repertory, meaning every day they met, and they sold the benefit. And that night they played the show that the Bennett was sold for. We had six spotlights and some border lights, and during the scene change, we dropped the curtain down, we hang lights, but no dimmers, get effects. The interesting thing about it all, with the limited resources, the feeling involved was the same. And what you look for in terms of an effect or what in terms of a feeling, the jokes are legion. When I do the book someday, the jokes will take over, not the lighting of the shows. <laughs> but there were a couple of moments in time when the Zimova did ghosts and she was rejected by the Theater Guild and somebody revived it and made millions of dollars, much to everybody's consternation. The last scene where her son sits at the couch near the window, and that diaphanous, strange, gray dawn is coming up, and she realizes the sins of the father, the syphilis and all, and she knows he will die, and she walks downstage, left from, back, from the back window of the fjords to a lamp, and she turns the lamp on, and her face looks like a death mask because she knows her whole life was worthless. Those were rare moments where that audience just gasped. The other one was more amusing, is what happened on My Fair Lady. At the beginning of the second act, she, Eliza sits on the couch Everybody's saying, you're wonderful, you did it, and all that kind of nonsense. And the housekeeper chases, chases the boys out of the room. And she says, Liza, why don't you sit down and rest and all the rest of it. And she turns the lights down in the study, and it goes blue, moonlight. But the pink spotlight's still on her. <laughs> Nobody said boo. I show up in Philadelphia. And Moss Hart once kicked me out of the theater. It's not a long story back in the 30s. <laughs> but he thought I'm going to change light cues. And Alan Lerner is looking at me and says, what are you doing here? Anything wrong? I said, no, no, nothing. And I'm looking. And sure enough, it bothered me. And that night, Jimmy Orr, a beloved friend and mentor, said, you came down for something, and I know it. I said, Jimmy, this is terrible. He said, what do you want to do? I said, well, a long time ago they taught me I can take a color frame, put two together, and I can slide it through so fast you don't know I've changed the color on you. He said, who taught you that? He said, the stage hand when I did the ballets at the Center Theater. So we did it. So Jimmy comes on stage and sits down like he's Eliza. He gets up and he starts singing the song. And the cue comes down and the lights change. Now, I didn't even see it from a pink to a diaphanous lavender, like moonlight, enough red in it, and then when she sang I Could Have Danced that night, she soared. I stay that night. I walk into the theater, they're looking at me, I walk away from them, comes the second act, I'm now standing in the back, and I'm looking. And suddenly, I feel Moss on this arm, Al on the other, says, what did you do? I says, wait till you see. And came the scene, and so far nothing or other, and all of a sudden, the lights dim down as she gets up to sing, I get a kiss on this cheek and a kiss on that cheek. <laughs> and I said, why did you distrust me? He says, because we're nervous. Because we don't know what's happening, but there's magic going on that stage, we don't want to screw it up. <laughs> okay. All of them here, all of us, have been through these interminable stories. Why? Because as that wonderful scene again in the second act of Skin of Our Teeth, when Mrs. Antropus throws the bottle into the ocean, when her husband 
is being, you know, involved with Saban in a tent and talks about the imperfection of marriages, and yet it was the only perfect form that life should have as Thornton Wilder saw it. The same thing happens. A lot of imperfect people get together. We don't know each other from Adam, but we seem to have a, a collaborative gift among each other. And out of it, when it works, it's magic. That's all I want to say. Thank you. I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> you can. You can stand up. You're taller. Okay. <laughs> um, people always ask me, uh, why did you become a lighting designer? And it's very simple with me. I, in the fourth grade play, turned the lights on for a show. All my life I have wanted to do that. I know that sounds really weird for a fourth grader to want to be a lighting designer. I do it to this day. It is my profession. I love it. Uh, it is what I've always wanted to do. Uh, and I don't know why I wanted to do that, but I'm sure I looked at a, a movie or something once and I thought that would be wonderful or some play. Jeff, what made you think that this would be the great career for you? I don't know. I started out wanting to be an actor originally. And um, luckily went to a school where you had to learn an awful lot of liberal arts. And if you majored in theater, you had to do all the other disciplines of theater. And I stumbled into lighting because that was the easiest crew they could put you on because you don't have to teach them how to do anything very complicated. And um, I uh, you know, hang this on this pipe and plug it in. And um, you know, I'm a college student, I can figure that out. Um, so, but through all of that, I became very interested in the kind of atmosphere that designers create on stage. I was never aware of it. And I don't think anybody in high school, when you first go to college, is aware of that. And it fascinated me. And uh, I suddenly, through taking, through being involved in it, became increasingly aware of what light does outside and what light does in nature. And I became more and more fascinated by it. And uh, subsequently, just found that much more interesting than acting. And a wonderful woman at Northwestern who was teaching acting then, Malvina Krauss, said to me, well, do you like lighting? And I said, I really do. But for totally, and she says, is it satisfying? I said, yes. And she said, as satisfying as acting. I said, but for totally different reasons. And she said, well, if you could stand to do it, you ought to because you'll make a living doing it much more than you would if you were an actor. <laughs> um, and it, I just stumbled across it, and I had no knowledge it even existed. And I just was fascinated by it and what light in the real world did. And uh, the fact that you could manipulate a mood and make people feel different than they did when they came into the theater, or it, it's just was fascinating. And I can't imagine now I ever wanted to be an actor. <laughs> Do you ever want to be an actor, Theron? Good God, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I know you went, to, uh, you went to Yale, but to get to Yale, what, what a sort well, of... I went to a, a small college in Kentucky, a one-man drama department. He was scared to death to plug in a light or anything else. And uh, you worked there for your tuition, and uh, I wangled my way into the theater knowing that I loved working on plays, knowing I hated to go on stage. And this meant building scenery and so forth. And it took me several years to, uh, and by the time I got to Yale, I knew that, no, uh, I really didn't want to build scenery the rest of my life. I knew that I was a designer. Um, but somehow it was the intangible, intangibility of light, I think, that, uh, that grabbed me. And I, uh, yeah, this is where I belong. I also hate to sketch, hate to sketch. And uh, <laughs> so I chose uh, this intangible profession, which uh, is the greatest. Uh, it's, and people then point out to me, say, well, you know, uh, there's nothing left to show for anything you've done. Once a show closes, that's it, which is very true. And uh, I've had shows close that I literally cried on closing night because I thought they were beautiful and well done and so forth and so on, and they're gone. But it's worth it. And I wouldn't do anything else for the world or would not have done anything else for the world. 
Uh, passion. It's wonderful. <laughs> uh, Peggy, you did want to be an actor, though, yes? Yes, I started in when we lived in Georgia, taking dancing there and wanting to be a dancer. Only then they only cast me in comedy parts. I got comedy solos. I wanted to be a member of the chorus, and, but I couldn't skip rope gracefully. I was taller than everybody in my class. So then I decided I was going to be an actor, and I went to Smith College to study all the theater. They, could, they had a dramatic arts major there. And then they'd only cast me in men's parts. <laughs> now, <laughs> I figured that men could do that better, and if I was only going to be never going to get cast in a proper part, to show them that I could make the audience laugh or cry or whatever. I'd better be a designer because the other thing I loved to do was paint and draw. So I studied scene design at Smith. They had an interdepartmental major there and it was quite one, I think they had it just for me. And it, it was just right for me and then I went to Yale and there I took an extra course in lighting design. They didn't expect anybody to take more than initial lighting design if you were going to be a scene designer, but I figured that that designing the theater is not for the theater is not only drawing and making models and so forth and, and architecture, but it's it's lighting. That's the other half. So I st studied lighting there and and a good thing I did because that's where I ended up getting work because it ha happened at that moment in the theater that there were not very many lighting designers. At that point, I think there were Abe Fader and Gene Rosenthal. And then I came along, and it was kind of nice then. It was kind of special. <laughs> <laughs> but I had great fun with doing lighting, and that there I could do some creative work, even while I was doing all the drafting up all the scenery and props and so forth for, worked with Oliver Smith for 20 years or so on all those things and very few scene designers knew much about lighting or really cared <clears throat> awfully much about, about it. They did rather like where the sunlight came from. They would, would give you an answer on that. But there are a lot of, of ideas that, that they did, didn't uh, bother with and I did and I, I really enjoyed it thoroughly. and. Uh, the thing is, the lighting designer is much more like an actor than the other designers because they have to be there. Every No cue happens unless they tell the electricians what to turn off, on, or whatever in order to find, make the scenes work. So in a way, you're, you're a collaborative director, which is kind of wonderful. And uh, anyway, that's how I got into the, the lighting design was from wanting to be an actor in the first place. <laughs> Abe, did you want to be an actor? You are an actor, wait. <laughs> I'm convinced anybody in the theater, including Theron, if an emergency occurred, Theron changed your wig, you're going on. I don't care what you do, but you have to cover. She would. There was something I would not turn all the lights off. All right. That's what I would do. But there's something indigenous about the Mountie Bank and the excitement behind the curtain line. Everybody is emotionally involved. That's the key. You're emotionally involved subconsciously whether you like it or not. And you're not separate. And you'll see an actor go on and something happens and you maybe die for her or him because somehow or other you're wrapped up in this thing emotionally. And that's another confusion, the word emotion. As far as I'm going to ever be an actor, they made me play the apothecary in my freshman year at Carnegie Tech. And the, I walked on the Shakespeare and apron and some of my young friends threw pennies on the stage. That was enough. That cured me for good. Because apparently I didn't convince anybody I looked like an apothecary. <laughs> but the irony that I found in terms of my relationship to it is there was a gentleman who I'm sure most of you don't even know. His name is Martin E. Brown, who was an ecclesiastical minister of the Church of England. 
who being seduced by a beautiful actress, became a director at Carnegie Tech in Pittsburgh in the 20s. This man had a religious fervor and did plays of a religious nature to a point where in the 30s, the Church of England gave him money as a backer to produce, direct, and find writers. Murder in the Cathedral is his fault. A Lady's Not for Burning is his fault. The Zeal of Thy House is his fault. And this relationship to this man, to me, gave me an insight as to the fervor of the whole religious base which is in the theater world. Now, of course, we're in a different phase. So I'm grateful to him for what he gave me, and he almost put me on stage a couple of times in clothes, just to walk out. So as an actor, we all are, every one of us, if you want to use the phrase actor, because we're all outgoing people. There's no inbreeding in any of these people. That's part of it. And don't go near it if you can't be it. Answer your question. Thank you. Um, we all collaborate, obviously, as Abe was just telling us, with a, a lot of people. When I told Theron I was going to ask this question, she didn't think maybe it was such a good question to ask. Um, collaboration is such a personal uh, uh, a moment, an event in our lives on a, on a theater piece. Um, whether it be with the director or the producer or the other designers, uh, with luck, I think it's a, a total collaboration of all departments. You know, I think there's nothing better than when you walk out of a show to say, boy, that was good. And when somebody asks you, how was the lighting, you go, oh, well, um, gee, I guess it was good. Uh, if you have come out having had a great time in the theater, I, I think one of the best examples I've ever seen of that was um, a chorus line. You walk out of a chorus line and it has been a draining experience, uh, an uplifting experience. And it is, as far as I'm concerned, total theater, because you don't come out whistling the scenery, you don't come out humming the lights, you don't come out any one thing except having had an incredible uh, evening in the theater. I've been lucky enough for many years to collaborate with Hal Prince on about 20 productions. That's uh, it's a family. It's a collaboration that makes life so easy. It's a um, moment you don't ever have to speak you know a grunt from the first row when a light cue comes up means a lot uh, you know it doesn't work um, <laughs> you don't need to be told that it's too bright or too dark that it's uh that there's uh something between you uh that all happens um but was that collaboration wonderful on chorus line obviously it was must well, have been. It, was, it it was wonderful uh spoils you because I've never had that experience before or since, except on future Michael Bennett shows. Uh, the collaboration with uh, Theone Aldridge doing costumes, Robin Wagner doing scenery, myself doing lights, and Michael, of course, directing, choreographing, writing, you name it, and Bob Avian. Uh, was the epitome of ideal collaboration. As I said, it, it spoiled me because uh, that's very hard to come by in our business, and uh, I've only had collaboration to that extent. I have good collaboration also with Hal Prince, Boris Aronson, Florence Klotz, um, but uh, the collaboration with Michael Bennett was uh, something very, very special, and I hope to find it again, uh, but uh, I'm doubtful. Well, we all keep looking. Peggy, who, who were your best collaborators? Who were uh, the ones that you had the well, I think of, of well, possibly Agnes DeMille was the, the most exciting to work with as a lighting designer, with a choreographer. You just had to look at her dances in rehearsal and you knew where the light should be. She didn't mind at all if you had things in some parts of the dance in silhouette. And now Jerry Robbins, on the other hand, with whom I did a number of shows, <laughs> When he finally liked the show, he wanted the lights full up. <laughs> Before that, it was agony trying to try one thing after another to suit the things, the ideas he had. But uh, 
there was an awful long time before he arrived at the point that he liked it enough <clears throat> that he could just say, all right, I want it now, I want it full and bright. <laughs> Played enough. Which was hard after you'd spent yeah. rather a long days. Well, it's awful when they do that to you. I know it's <laughs> all happened to us. Um, I remember once lighting a show with uh, Blanche Yurka. And, I, 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 <laughs> oh, <laughs> and she came in and she did, it was a, a benefit, uh, but she was, came in and she did her piece and she came off stage and she took me aside and she said, uh, you're very talented. She said, you are a great artist. She said, what you have done to the stage is one of the greatest things I've ever seen, to take this room and turn it into that. And she said, I just have one note, turn on the lights. <laughs> so, <it's>, uh, <laughs> Um, Abe, who have been your favorite collaborators? Will you bear with me a moment? Sure. <clears throat> I think in the course of a lifetime, occasionally, and you're not aware of it at the time, something happens that's never done again. And that was the situation of Orson Welles and myself. Not John Hausman. <laughs> Nobody else. <laughs> but the story of Orson, who was a child of 21. Now I look back in time and I say, he's a child. So was I. I was older by a few years. He had just been through a show called 10 Million Ghosts, where he tried to compete with a 40-foot cannon over his head, and he was a failure. He came running back to the Federal Project and said to, to John, I want a show with no scenery, no costumes, in other words, himself. And the show was called Dr. Faust by a gentleman named Marlowe. And we had a permanent theater called the Max and Elliot. It don't exist anymore. And it was of a classical nature. We put a Shakespearean apron on it and thank the Lord for one of my favorite people named Teddy Tomaszewski, or Teddy Thomas, who himself was a director in his own right, knew magic, and the magic tricks put in. Now, the trick was that if people were to appear and disappear on stage, no scenery. So I was a designer, set designer, too, if you call it such. Entire thing black, walls black. But within it were three traps, here, here, one in the back. And within it, how do you make people appear and disappear in space? You do the old magic trick. Somebody stands here and says, I'm leaving. Oh, no, you're not. And you, you, you know, and he's gone. But he's not gone because he ran down the steps. Because a cone of black curtains hanging in the air dropped like a knife. It's that fast. If you got caught in the wrong place, you'd get hit on the head. <laughs> so they're rehearsing in light to watch it. The other trick was, you didn't know there were cones. You didn't see them. Because the light in the first 10 feet of the stage was so controlled that even the bounce light went that away. So that you didn't know there were cones. And you couldn't put a light on in the air because you'd see that beam. If this was all painted black, you'd see these shafts of light. They're beams. So every beam that came on from 24 feet in the air would look like this. So the beams became columns of light. From the side, there were columns of light. And no spill. Absolute control. Question was, every time he moved, that cue had to move with him. So it took six weeks to find out how he moved. And we're on government money, your money at that time. So there was no problem with the crews. <laughs> now everything was fine, and we moved columns of light and color. When you put a pink light on, it looked peculiar. If you dimmed it down, the filament got yellow. If I got a dimmer here to dim this down, you'd see it, it would get yellow in the filament. So the warm light was dimmed down light. So I hung more, dim them down to get that shaft of warm. Then cool, a very slender pit, only two colors, the warm and the cool. Everything was fine. We got the Q74, and I stupidly got pneumonia and was home in bed. 
Nothing moved. The collaboration was so close, every move, that it had to be integral. And I, a whole month, I'm gone. And one morning, I don't know why, I got up and went back to the theater. Because I suddenly realized we're coming to the devil coming for Faustus. And there's no devil that shows up, nobody. Just him down in one with everybody leaving. And suddenly we realized how do we psychologically enmesh him? Simple. We would use lines that look like a web. The web would come on him, this and that, and the smoke would rise through that. And there he stood, enmeshed. And the clanging began to occur. And Orson saying, hey, you'll kill me. I don't know where I'm at. It's so blinding out here with all the smoke. So in the course of the smoke coming up, two people in black outfits held him. They knew where he was going to move. And as this wall of light came on, blinding that audience with all that smoke, his face came through it. And in a magical moment, wham, it's all out, and the fire behind him, he's gone. Shocking. How do you climax Mr. Marlowe's final speech? Somebody's going to come out and say it with a spotlight on him? Won't work. Through the smoke comes this idiot dressed, you know, like the abbot with a lantern. You don't even see half of them, but you hear this incredible sonorous voice telling you about the woes of fooling around with the devil. And when he turns around, he's gone. Nobody sat up, stood up, nothing. For five minutes, they were stunned. Orson used to be scared stiff every night because through the smoke, if they didn't grab him, he'd get killed. He'd fall back in the trap. And there was actual fire. They can't let you do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is that never again will a thing like this ever happen. Because that one moment of rare collaboration in something that lost us all for about two months, it ran for about a year, it was even too much for him. It was too overwhelming, too overloading for one performer to handle the timing of cue to cue to cue. It's almost impossible. That, to me, when I think of it, is my greatest collaboration. Terrific. Sounds like a good one. <laughs> oh, boy. I don't think it'll happen again. It's not the real fire. That's right. I'm going to skip the next question I had written here, because it's, it's a question people always ask me. Maybe people have a quick answer. Is People always come up to me and say, well, what's your favorite show that you've done the lighting for? Well, then you can break it down into opera, play, uh, nightclub act, whatever. Uh, and I don't ever have answers. Anybody have answers for what their favorite? What uh, I'm working on right now. That's ah. it. Absolutely. Whatever it is. That's it. That's the answer. <laughs> Onward to the next thing here. Um, We've come a long way from the 30s, uh, as we've seen in the world of light bulbs uh, presented to us on stage. Uh, equipment has come a long way. Uh, we've gone from direct current and piano boards to alternating current, and then finally to computers. I know that, um, I believe, Abe, you were the first person to put uh, auto transformer dimmers on a show, which was My Fair Lady. Um, correct. And um, at that time, all theaters in this country were direct current, DC as we know it. And uh, shows, when My Fair Lady went on the road, it went on with these boards that Abe had invented, which took alternating current, AC. So if you wanted My Fair Lady in your theater in America, they had to change the electricity to alternating current. Thank you, by the way. Um, <laughs> but. Because of that, we have gotten to having computers, and the uh, equipment has changed. And as well as the equipment changing, the attitude toward the designer has changed a great deal. Uh, the way the designer works has changed, and the prestige of the designer has changed quite a bit. Um, I guess first, there's many parts to this, but uh, the equipment change has uh, changed what design is, uh, Jeff. Do you, uh, what is, uh, I guess, what do you think is the, the best change, or what has happened to lighting that is probably the most important thing? Is it the people recognizing us, or the equipment, or what? Um, I think as a tool, I think the most important thing, obviously, that's helped us is computer boards. Um, 
because I think it allows us to get our ideas faster, and we don't also have to worry about how so, how a particular cue will happen. And the, when you had to design on piano boards, you had or any kind of manual board, you had to figure out, no matter what your idea was, could the number of people involved run it? And that was very important to how one cue to show. Now you don't really have to think about that. And in fact, the sophistication with which you can move light around is extraordinary. And you know, the board's really incredible. I think the, the downfall to that is that there are two parts to it. I think that particularly a lot of the younger directors that are working don't understand what we do or how it's done. And because we can work very fast on computer boards, I think the problem is that they want it instantly. And they, the number of times the directors have said to me, now we're not going to have to stop and wait for you during tech, are we? <laughs> Excuse me? Um, you know, you've been doing this for four weeks. Um, but I think it's also, been, it's in some cases, been a hindrance to us in terms of the working relationship with particularly directors and producers. Because I think because you have this expensive piece of machinery, you don't need the time to do the art part of it. Uh, yes, you only need one operator, but it still takes time to make the stage picture and refine it. And I think that's what they realize that, well, we don't need to do that anymore because you're very fast with a computer. Um, so I think that it's helped us and hurt us in some ways, right. I think. Well, Sarah and I know got the first computer on Broadway with a chorus line. But I think, Peggy, didn't you have one when you used to do the Civic Light Opera shows in the early 60s on the West Coast? <coughs> yes, Sweet Betsy. Yes, Mercy me. <laughs> <laughs> we name computer yes. boards. <laughs> we name the first ones. We've given up now. Yes, what's, <laughs> what's the one on chorus line called? Sam. Well, that was because well, Sam's George, retired. Oh, okay. George, the electrician, drank coffee on his board and he spilled it and he'd used a lot of sugar yeah. in it. And the only thing that went wrong, he had dried everything out, worked very hard. But it destroyed the memory part of right, it. Right, right. <laughs> so I knew it no. was a female. Yeah. Right. So I no, the, her Bessie May. The beginning of those like boards, those you couldn't those. smoke in the room. You didn't take coffee in there. I mean, it was uh, real voodoo land. Uh, <laughs> when you first used them, Peggy, did they cut back on your time to design the shows? Was that, uh, that all that tech time eliminated because all of a sudden you had this no, new tool? No, not out there. Not out on the West Coast. They, there's no time on the West Coast. All right, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Abe, you've worked with the memory boards. What do you, what do you think of this fabulous new uh, <laughs> invention in the theater? Careful. <laughs> I have to quote a character whose name is Colonel Churchill. Colonel Churchill was the gentleman responsible for creating the World's Fair for uh, Montreal. And he was also famous in Canada because he was sent by the Canadian government to do the Canadian side of the do line. And he made a very cryptic uh, criticism or comment about the whole computer story. And he said, you know, man creates it. And many minds created the programming, some of the greatest minds in the college world. But why are they so stupid sometimes? And in their stupidity, they program the machine in terms of their limitation, and most of them don't know a goddamn thing about lighting. <laughs> For sure. So the programming you are doing, if you do a cue, Example, when I was trying to program no actors, just the bloody water and the lights at Prometheus, took me three and a half weeks. And I had one of my favorite friends who's an electrician for the theater at the computer board. And I say, well, that's good. I want to make a change. Just go get yourself drunk. I'll pay an hour before I can show you. So the time factor of reprogramming that bloody machine has to go back into a memory approach for it that to the theater is expensive, whether they like it or not. And they haven't appreciated it yet because they go to their office and play with their little computer and they get the figures fine. That's my basic criticism. One of these days can, as you get older, start to program the bloody machine so people who want to like the show will understand. It's getting there. It's getting there. Good. Right. That's all. <laughs>
Um, attitude towards the designer seems to have changed. Uh, opera has been the last uh, holdout, as far as I've seen. The, uh, for years, opera companies refused to admit there was a lighting designer. Mostly in Europe, they still don't admit there is a lighting designer. Um, but we are recognized now. We are, we are nominated for Tony Awards. Uh, that phenomenon happened in 1970. Uh, we weren't deemed good enough to be nominated for a Tony until 1970. Um, the union that we all belong to, the United Scenic Artists, didn't think there was a, wouldn't, didn't create a category of lighting designers till about 1962. Before that, you had to design scenery and costumes as well as you designed lighting. Uh, so we've come a, a ways since then. Um, do you find that, uh, I let it leave this up to anybody, do you find that our uh, prestige has changed? Or does the public understand us? Do they know what we do? I think it's certainly come a long ways. Uh, it's uh, got a long ways to go. Uh, as you said, the Tony Awards now, at least they uh, know, at least we have credits. Thank you, Peggy, on uh, show cards, usually when a director gets credit and, uh, and so forth. So they know there's this person there. How much they know about what we do, I, I don't know. But certainly in the business, the prestige uh, has raised. They now know they, should, they need a lighting designer, more than they knew when I started even. Uh, or they'd call you the night before and that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's come a very long way. Uh, still think, as far as the public knowing what we do, I'm not, I'm not sure how important that is, really. Uh, um, well, you read uh, notices on a, a real turkey show and you go, thank God I wasn't mentioned. Uh, <laughs> because obviously this is a guy who hated everything. Uh, lighting is, uh, is, is uh, I'm not talking about rock and roll entertainment lighting so much now as I'm talking about shows. It's a pretty subliminal thing. And uh, I'm not sure how much the public needs to know about what we do. I think it's nice that they're beginning to know that we do. And that's enough. Okay. Uh, Peggy, I remember you used to tell a story, which uh, maybe you can tell, about one of the, a musical that you were out of town with and them not letting you on stage to focus. Mm. Yes, we went through those days. <laughs> those days, indeed. We're having problems about the... Well, it was partly when we were trying to set up the Lighting Associates group, because the uh, stagehands didn't... They figured they did the lighting with the directors and they didn't then designers do their own lighting and they didn't really see why we should have any separate category or separate contract and so they brought in the, into the impasse and negotiations with the League of New York Theaters that they just wouldn't service the shows if we had had the uh, lighting designers and the United Scenic Artists so it held us back for a while and I happened to go to New Haven with a show opening out of town, just in the track of Donald Owens Lager having been kept off the stage and Boris Aronson, a number of them. They were going after everybody at that point. I promptly called my, my union and the union uh, representative and he got to work talking to Walsh at the IA and, and uh, Finally, they got it settled in time that I could come on stage because I just said, I just cannot focus this show properly from out front. I've got to, when I'm lighting the, light the show, I want to know those lights are there from where they are on the whole up and down part of the stage, not just what you can see, the horizontal plane. And I just have to know it from being there so that I can light it from out front later. And finally, they did let us do that, but it was really very awkward for a while there. Did you ever run into anything, Abe, of people not wanting you around and not uh, knowing what you did and not wanting you? I don't know whether you were, were doing a show at that time or not. It's very funny. The unions <clears throat> dominate the thing. And anybody who was confused about that, let me put you at ease. <laughs> you must be a member of one of the structures of the theater. The scenic artist 
which controls stage designers, costume designers, did not have a category for lighting designers. No, you had makeup. And in 1940, before, and 42, before I was drafted in the Army, I went down to redo skin of our teeth. I'm about to be drafted to serve my country, and I come into New York, and the agent for no, local number one walks into the theater and says, get off the stage. Well, he had been a pugilist in his youth, so I wasn't going to argue. <laughs> <laughs> his name was Sally Prince. Right. Oh, and yes. uh, I walked off the stage and sat in the first row, and the guy who was the producer, a guy named Meyerberg, who had gone to the trouble to get me out of the army at Mitchell Field, I'm in uniform, to bring me down to Washington to relight the show for Tallulah. And he did it. And here was a GI private sitting in the first row, I can't do anything. <clears throat> uh, he turned around and threatened to close the show now. It was in the Schubert Theater. And the union got very upset. He was gonna announce the fact that he brought this GI out of the army <laughs> to, light, to help relight the show because it was miserable in Washington. It was the first time they were confronted in a manner that they never had before. So yes, I started lighting in the theater <clears throat> after 1950. I became a scenic designer passing the exam to do it. That's how it started. So the idea of rejection off is an old, old story for everybody here. The price they pay to be a lighting designer. And Ken, you're lucky. You're the inheritor Absolutely. of all this. Yes, and I thank you every day. <laughs> Believe me, I'd heard these stories. Um, we're going to run short on time shortly, so we want to do some questions and answers. But I'd like to let everyone here have a few minutes to say whatever they think they should say to you to, uh, about lighting. Uh, it's, uh, we all have very different ideas, and all towards the same end. Uh, but I know that I find that <clears throat> lighting is... Um, it's, the most exciting thing I can do. I get up in the morning and I'm really happy that that's what I do. The collaboration's exciting. The, the joy, the thrill to sit in a theater. I mean, there's nothing more exciting for me to be doing a big Broadway musical and you've gone through the, however long it is, getting it to the, off the drawing board, through the rehearsals, through the rehearsals, through the tech rehearsals where they yell at you, through the scenery fouling, through everything. And all of a sudden comes the dress rehearsal. And the curtain comes in, and the dress rehearsal is supposed to start at 2 o'clock, and you're lucky if it gets going by 4. But at some point, the house lights go to half, and the overture starts. The follow spot hits the conductor, the footlights come up, and I cry. And it's everything I've always wanted out of life. I think it's just, usually when the curtain goes up on the first scene, I'm also crying for the wrong reasons. <laughs> but it's, it's a great passion. And um, so I'm going to start with Jeff and go through the line here and see if there's anything they would like to say to you. It's a, we know, people have mentioned it through the afternoon about collaboration. And uh, one, I don't think there's enough of it. And I think that uh, uh, part of that is people not knowing that sitting around and talking through a show and dealing with it is, doesn't cost money. And uh, the sharing of ideas. I think there are too, too many instances where people are hired haphazard. And if you're a lighting you get you know, given a tube of drawings and say, here's the scenery. Uh, that's not conducive for collaboration. But I also think, too, it's very important for all of us as lighting designers and everybody else in the business and every other end of the business to understand what each other, what each other does. Because it's very hard to collaborate with a scene designer if you don't understand what the scene designer's problems are and what they do. It's very, it's very hard to light costumes if you don't understand fabric. So all of this, I think, knowing what everybody else does in the, in the, in the different factions of the business, are very important to collaboration, plus given the time for it. And that's what I would like to vote for. <laughs> Amen. There. Well, let back up what uh, Jeff says. I do want to add one more thing about uh, computer boards, since I got some of this by helping birth them. Um, <laughs> 
There is one great thing that uh, that we now have used to drive me crazy uh, when a show opened and you went away, and you'd come back two weeks later and it just didn't look like the same show. And the people running the show, I mean, after all, they're human beings, and you'd have a 10 count cue or 30 count cue, and depending on how the guy felt that night, it might be one minute, uh, it might be two hours, uh, you know, it was hopeless. And one of the things that the computer board has given us, which uh, for an audience, uh, is marvelous is that the the consistency of the show that it stays that way uh, every night and that is a great satisfaction to me one of the disadvantages in talking about disadvantages um, is that they allow um, a lot more equipment without the management really caring in the in the old days with the road boards the number of boards you used had to do with the number of men that were hired. Well, a manager immediately multiplies that man by 52 weeks, and he can't afford it, and you've got to cut the show. Now, that's not true because one computer board, one man can run whatever you can get up there. Um, I think as a result of that, uh, what's happening to lighting design, I don't like a lot of what I see because it, it's... I'm seeing a lot of what I call supermarket lighting uh, of people being brought up in the school where, boy, you better be sure you need every piece of equipment you have because you're going to have to fight it out with the management in order to get it. Uh, you really did your homework, and I'm not sure that much homework is happening in a lot of areas now. I just see shows that are just overloaded with equipment, and I call it supermarket lighting, that, well, if we put all this up, we go in and something's bound to work, you know, somewhere. <laughs> And what I'm seeing in a show, so many shows, and I don't want to sound like an old crank, but I am, um, <laughs> is I'm not seeing a point of view on that stage. Um, and I'm seeing mush, uh, uh, just light, or as Peggy said, put them all up full. And anybody can do that. So that, I just wanted to add it in, add in terms of the whole computer board uh, happening. Peggy, what would you like to tell us all? Well, I just want to wind up with a, a, a wire I remember from Harold Rome, who originally did Pins and Needles. It was a thing called Bless You All we did. But he sent me an opening night wire, which I've never forgotten and think belongs to all of it. And said, God said, let there be light. And there was Peggy Clark. <laughs> <laughs> Abe, I know we had talked about this earlier. But, uh, <clears throat> what would you like to say to us? Well, in retrospect, the poverty of the 30s, when money was really at a premium, the attitude towards the respect for it and what you did. But today, we have a new breed called general man adjourns. <laughs> they are not producers. They set up structure for what a show should be. Some producers don't even have their own offices. They use the offices of the managers. Aside from the word colorblind, <laughs> they have no knowledge of a sense of theater physical structures or what variations they can be, a designer may come along for a big musical and say it's going to cost $2 million, a producer do it for a million and we'll do the show. Do they know how, when they look at what they see, what indigenously can be changed or moved? So there's a limitation in what they know. And anybody can be a producer, just bring the money. That's still the name of the game. So the problem of the other side of the coin of the purism, as Ken said, the wonderful thing of being in the theater, the tragedy which confronts the theater world with the scope of a show like Chess that cost millions died, with another one about Legs Diamond died, and the blame was on 
the physical production more than on the nature of the book and the script. So somewhere along the line, in this collaboration I speak of, there is a basic weakness, and I'm not talking about theater owners, because the Billy Rose who owned the Ezekiel Theater said owning a theater is a license to steal because one month's gross of a show paid for all the expenses of the year. So the profit he made was extraordinary. Right now, in the case of the Broadway Theater with the Schubert's organization, a cat's, three or four, can support all 16 theaters, and most of them closed. So there's something peculiar structurally, economically, in the minds of those who are producing the shows and the management. Uninformed, only based on a rule of thumb of what the last show was. That's one of the weaknesses of the theater management group in the theater right now. Because their cost, which has kept the theater down in terms of new blood and new money, is their lack of total managerial grasp. They couldn't run, you know, hamburger heaven. They couldn't run a place like that. They were closed. That lack is what the price we all pay for, too as I look through the years. Hasn't changed. That's the tragedy. So as far as I'm concerned, they should be brought to judgment in terms of the theater. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a few minutes left. I would like to, we have some questions that we could ask, the uh, audience would like to ask any one of us. I think we have a microphone down here just so if you could talk loudly. So this is being taped by the uh, Museum of the City of New York. So yes. after the show is closed. Um, it's hard. Um, I know I see lots of people. Theron sees lots of people. I guess we all do. Um, I always dislike slides. I Amen. Think slides are lovely. If uh, they're good slides, I, I love them. If they're bad slides, I hate them. Um, they have nothing to do with your work as your lighting. I always feel that when I interview somebody a portfolio, I like to look at their work and they print. Do they have a concept of the play? Do they have? And it's all about talking to them to see what passion is. Passion is, I think, makes a great lighting designer. What do you look for, Theron? Well, certainly the passion. I interviewed someone not too long ago that uh, we had talked for a while, and he said, well, I'm not really sure about lighting design. And I went, what? <laughs> and uh, I'm not really sure. And I said, there's the door. Yeah. I said, if, you're, if it's not your total commitment, Forget about it. And I certainly want no part of you. I might want to write. I said, good, we need writers. Bye. <laughs> uh, you certainly look for that. And depending on if you're looking for an assistant, which is usually what we interview for, you're looking for uh, uh, organization paperwork, of paperwork, uh, printing, and that kind of thing. I agree with Ken. Pictures, no. Pictures, slides are never true to what uh, the lighting really looks like. Uh, as far as I'm concerned. I don't have one picture of any show I've ever done. I, I was just uh, at a, the Lighting Design International convention in Nashville, and they wanted pictures of all my Broadway shows. <laughs> Call Mark, Martha Swope. Right. <laughs> and, uh, we sat there, and about this much photography was on stage. Yes? Somebody who wants to go. Um, okay, I'll go. I, I think the first thing I, that I do is read the script three or four times relatively quickly, and not necessarily to figure out how I'm going to light the show, but what, uh, what, the, what the feel of the piece actually is. Uh, and I don't like to spend much time doing it, because without a scene designer, uh, you're really thinking in a vacuum, because the the scene designer and the lighting designer are the ones that really, more than any two of the designer elements, create the environment. And you could, if you have any kind, of, particularly if you have any kind of scenery background, 
as I sort of do, you can start formulating what you would do if you were designing the scenery. And then it's suddenly pretty difficult when you, someone brings something that's totally different than what you would have thought about. So I don't like to spend much time by myself. I think it's dangerous. And then it becomes a, then you want to get with the set designer and the costume designer and the director very much and find out what they want the play to be. Because what I, what I hate is when you go to a meeting and they say, well, what do you think? What do you think the show should look like? Well, it really should come from the director. Um, you know, there's one bus driver here, and it really should be the director sort of guiding everybody else down, hopefully, the same path. So I think it's really important to get a feel of it and then get with the other collaborators very, very quickly, and hopefully before they've started building the scenery in the scene shop. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I take the script. I love to go out to my house uh, out at the beach and sit on the couch and read it, and if I enjoy the play, then I read it a second time. If I hate it, I figure out what I'm going to tell them because I don't want to do it. Uh, and it's about reading a play. Do you like the play? If you like the play, then do it. Depending. <laughs> Who's doing it? Right. <laughs> I don't know. There comes a time when there are some people in our business that I go, oh, no, 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 no. I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Peggy? I think you're saying it very well. Oh, good. <laughs> and Abe? Same. Darren did it well. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Yes. Um, they're all over the place. Colleges are turning them out. I think, um, I'm sure there's a lot of young lighting designers. This lady is obviously looking. Um, you're looking, that's it, hang out. <laughs> I'd like to answer that. There is a bunch of young designers, lighting, costume, who get into the union. Now they're young, it doesn't mean they're gonna get to work. The number of productions available to do are limited. I'm sure if you call, this is a plug for 829, if you call the union for the younger ones who just got on, I'm sure they would consider something you asked them to do. You're living in a dream world. <laughs> Why? <laughs> They, they took us in, but they don't know we exist. And they have no idea what we do. Yes. Sorry, Peggy. Yes, sir. <laughs> I have a question for the professor, if I could, and, and then the rest of you as well. Um, you mentioned in one of your interviews that, that the, the passion is gone for the moment as far as uh, lighting designers that are up and coming and so forth. Um, do you think, think this is just a phase? Is it something that you feel personally because of an incident? Is it something everyone feels? And what can rectify the situation? People are the only thing that create passion. Uh, I don't know. Um, I shouldn't have said it's gone for the moment. I say that I am feeling a lack of it uh, in people, young people that I talked to out of school. As I said, this one person said, well, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it uh, reflects on the condition of our theater here. I don't think so because regional theater uh, is alive and well out there and so forth. Uh, I just uh, don't feel a drive. Now maybe it's the same thing in any profession, not just the theater, but I'm not feeling uh, the drive that um, seemed to me to be prevalent. Uh, when we were coming along and a whole bunch of us would work a whole summer off Broadway for no money and put on these plays better than anybody else could, you know. And all that. I'm, not, I'm not feeling that. Uh, and I could be wrong. I hope I am. Uh, I invite you to Bridgeport. <laughs> Bridgeport? No, I live in the western part of the state. <laughs> I, I've also found, you know, somebody asked me this que very question yesterday. I think maybe there's many passionate people. Uh, but at once upon a time when there were not not every college in America taught lighting. Uh, those six people who really wanted to do it this year really had to fight their way up and get to being a lighting designer. Uh, and they would get to New York, and they would bang on every door and make pests of themselves. Those people, I think, are still there. What has happened, I think, is now the university system turns out hundreds and hundreds of lighting designers. 
uh, and there's hundreds of them who don't really have that passion. I think the six people, uh, I'm making that number up, but I think that six, those six people still exist. I just think we are inundated with so many more now. Another, another thing I would say is I think that in going out teaching at various colleges and things I've done, I think that there's also a problem that people view theater education in the same way that people view learning to be a stockbroker. That so often people you know, will say things like, well, if I go to four years of school and pay whatever thousands of dollars a year to go, uh, I should, one, be know how to do everything when I get out of school, and I should be able to make X amount of dollars. And you literally hear people say this. So if you're going in to do this for a living to make a certain amount of money, it's the wrong thing to go into. <laughs> because if you don't have the passion to do it, if you have the passion to do it, you'll probably survive in it. But if your goal is to go out and make a certain amount of money and drive a sports car your first year out of college, don't bother. Yes. I have a two-part question, mostly for Theron. Um, one is, you mentioned about directors not knowing how to talk to you and say, just talk to them like you talk to your actors. Well, do you think, though, that directors should have more of a technical expertise, at least know the terminology for the, for the things you use, or really just be able to describe a mood and have you come up with with what they're going to want without spending hours and hours of try the overhead lights and that try the side lights and that yeah. try the foot lights. I mean, it can take forever, and mostly you don't have that kind of time. And the second part is sort of follow up on this other woman's question. If I'm trying to find a lighting designer and I meet 10 people with lots and lots of passion, how do I know that technically they are going to know how to light what I want to light? The, the passion could be there in lots of people passion for their careers, but how else do you know if Well, right I have to do this ass backwards. Um, <laughs> how you know, I'm afraid, is to see their work. You can sense a certain amount in talking to people, but um, we can't, we don't have a portfolio of sketches and all like that to show. As far as uh, directors and what they know, I know they don't need to know the difference between a Fresnel and a Lico and uh, all that mumbo jumbo stuff. Uh, most of us don't know a lot of that either. Um, <laughs> we find out as we need to, and we're not electricians. See, this was the confusion in the beginning. Electricians did a lot of the lighting on Broadway early on. And uh, we're not electricians, we're designers. And I think for directors to have eyes would be great. Uh, to know, walk in the theater and say, what's the weather like outside, to see if they know if the sun's out or not. You know, just to be observant. Um, that's the only way I know that you create pictures in your head which you hope directors and choreographers do when they start to do a piece and transfer those pictures to us. How those pictures are achieved is our problem. But uh, knowing technical mumbo jumbo, I don't think, as I said, that didn't mean Tiddly poo. We're looking for people with eyes uh, and with a vision when they read something. Uh, they read a travel log, they have a vision of what the Bahamas are like, for Christ's sake, you know? Yeah. And the other thing is, too, I think that what you indicated, too, is as lighting designers, we don't want someone to tell us how to solve the problem. We don't want a director to say, try the footlights, try the side lights. Uh, it's our job. You'd have to tell us what you want it to look like. And if you have to bring in a painting, a photograph, or something to be able to describe, if you can't describe visually, do what you have to do. But talk to us in visual terms and don't tell us how to do it, because that's really what we're, that's what we're supposed to do. You know, I, I'd like to add a footnote to that. You think the problem is yours? You asked, how do I find a lighting designer? What are you looking for? What are you seeing? What are you trying to do? So if your language in question to the designer and he or she doesn't give you satisfaction in terms of what you're asking for, and then that's not the person either. So you're looking for a lexicon of language within your frame of reference that somebody would have to respond to so you'd accept and live with. That's really the problem. We have a couple of minutes left. I can do two more questions. Yes. Which one? Or the scene where all the lights combine uh, on, on orcs and whales and you oh. develop the smoke. What I'm really asking is not necessarily where did that idea 
idea come from. But if a director is looking for a kind of effect, who will get that sort of thing for it? Does it come from the script or the lighting designer, the director, or the scene designer? Well, supposedly, the lighting designer, if the director miasmically or what, tries to explain in words. And he's not a playwright. So he may be inept in his language to explain to what you're trying to do. Fortunately, there is a stage set designer of a form within which this to take place. Already, you're already confining the parameters. Now, he wants a certain thing within those parameters as a director and the playwright may be too, then it's up to the lighting designer to solve it, if it's possible. Okay. Uh, this gentleman, and that's the last one. One question, this may be for Sarah. How do you figure out just how much firepower you really need? For instance, when you sat down with Robin Wagner to design a chorus line, would you, with the technology where it is today, would you use more lighting now than you originally used? To, or how do you know what to cut back and what you basically need? I don't know if I can answer that very well. I, uh, well, no, it's, uh, I, I really study when I hang a light pipe uh, on the drawing board what those lights are going to do, what they're for. I go through the script, what I need here, there, and there, and there, that is specific, that I know. Then you add a little extra where you have space to cover yourself. Uh, because, well, you don't know when they're going to decide to do the second act first and all of that, and uh, you've got to be prepared for a certain amount of that. But I call it homework. Uh, I call it, and if you don't have the space to hang what you think is necessary, then you've got to have a fight with that designer and say, I've got to have more space here because I've got to do this and I can't do it with this kind of space. Um, win, lose, or draw. It, but you have a reason for everything you put up there. And then cover yourself a little, but I don't mean cover yourself with 20 light pipes uh, and all, all of that. But you really think about it and you really, um, as I said, do your homework, have a reason. And no, if I were doing uh, that show today, I would not do anything differently, I don't think. But I won't do shows I've already done. I, that scares me. <laughs> all right. I think we've really come to our end. If we can come up and you can ask us a few questions, we need to be out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excuse me, I want to borrow this microphone for a second. I'd like to say thank you very much to our panel. I hope you enjoyed the afternoon. We have to say a special thanks to the people who did the sound for us, this mask sound, and to Ken Billington's staff who put lights on the subject here. <laughs> when we walked in here, there were only some red light bulbs, and half of them were all blown out. So he and his staff did some extra work. Thank you very much, and we hope that you will support Direct from Broadway and come back to our future seminars. Thank you.